Hey everyone, my name is Chris Kerber and in this talk I will speak about solving integer linear programming problems on quantum and leading hardware. This work, which by now you can hopefully find on the archive, was worked out by my collaborators C.C. Chen, whom you may also know as Jason, C.C. Chen, Travis Humble, Jim Ostrowski and me. Now, the interesting part about this collaboration is that we combine different expertise ranging from physics over math to software engineering, which you can also notice by observing this talk structure. As such, this talk is divided into three parts. The first mathematical part addresses how to solve constraint integer problems on an annealer. The second experimental part analyzes how you can tweak parameters to improve solutions. And the third physics-inspired part displays simulations of the annealing hardware aimed at identifying concepts which affect the outcome. So uh, without further ado, let's start. Now, what is integer linear programming? You can basically view it as minimizing a certain constraint like f of x being equal to c dot x, where both c and x are vectors under a given constraint ax smaller or equal to b, which is a matrix equation. x itself is an integer larger or equal to zero, and all of the conditions could also be shuffled around by introducing minus signs. To mention an example, you could picture storage optimization. You have a given volume, and you have some objects you want to fit in this volume. Now, the importance of these objects would be the c vector, while the constraint is dictated by the size of the volume and the objects. There are several other interesting examples to mention, and the key idea is that you have an integer quantity you want to optimize under given constraints. Why would we consider such problems? Now, obviously those problems are interesting for themselves, but also in the context of quantum computing, there is a nice mapping between integers and qubits. In particular, if you would consider brute force solvers, you have to scan the space of all available integers which fulfill the constraints. Fortunately, there is a nice mapping between bits and integers, and thus just a small set of qubits could represent an exponentially large set of integers. A key concept for mapping these inequalities to the annealer hardware is the introduction of slack variables. And the basic idea is that instead of writing ax smaller equal to b, you can just write ax plus s equal to b, where s is some integer number, or it actually can also be a real number with finite precision. How does this help? What you may realize is that instead of minimizing your objective function over the variable x, you now have to minimize a new objective function over as well x and s. The trick here is that this new objective function is a combination of your original objective function, c dotted into x, but also a new penalty function times a constant small p. This new penalty function p of x and s is nothing else than what has previously been the inequality constraints, now formulated as an equality equal to zero, such that if you actually do fulfill this inequality, your penalty function will be zero. If not, it will be larger than zero. The penalty term small p itself has to be larger than the largest value of the condition you want to optimize. Now, depending on what kind of problem you look at, it might actually also be possible to set it to a smaller value. The key point being is that you want to minimize the objective function as well as fulfilling your penalty. This new objective function x, depending on x and s, is quadratic as well in x as in s, and as such, it can be mapped into a cubo representation, which is of the form psi dotted into q dotted into psi plus a constant. This new vector psi is a combination of those x and s variables. However, its individual components are just 0 and 1. So you need a transformation mapping psi into x and s. Q, the Hamiltonian or so-called cubo, is then mapped onto the needing hardware and the constant itself is not too important. Thus far, the formulation has been quite abstract. So let me give you a concrete example, and the example to mention here is the so-called minimum dominating set problem. So what's the minimum dominating set problem, or in more general, what's the dominating set problem? And the dominating set problem is defined as such. For a given graph consisting out of several nodes V, you pick a subset of nodes D, and all of the nodes which are in D plus the nodes adjacent to D give you back the entire graph all of the nodes v. So if you look at the graph below, the blue nodes, five of them, which is also the dominating number, and all the nodes adjacent to the, the white nodes actually bring you back the entire graph or all of the nodes v. A minimal dominating set is a specific form of a dominating set, which is special in the sense that it's not possible anymore to remove any node out of the dominating set and still have a dominating set. So if you compare the left graph to the right graph, you can see that there is this one lower node, which is now becoming white. You can still remove from a dominating set, 
and still have a dominating set. However, the set you see right here, it's not possible to remove any more nodes and still have a dominating set because then you will have nodes not adjacent to the dominating set. A minimum dominating set is again a specific minimal dominating set, note that it's minimal minimum, with the key property that it has the least amount of nodes in the dominating set. Note for this particular example that you can, by reshuffling the nodes in the previous minimal dominating set a slightly bit, it's possible to also have a dominating set, but just requiring three nodes. And as a nice cross check while gathering data from our computations, we actually figured out there's even smaller minimum dominating set such that you just need two nodes to have a dominating set. All right, so now since the problem is defined, we can discuss the mapping. The condition we want to minimize is the number of nodes within the dominating set. In other words, we want to minimize the sum over a variable defining whether or not a node is in the dominating set or not. And this variable xi representing for each node tells you whether or not the node is in or not. So if you take a look at the node I've labeled with number one, the neighborhood of number one is two and four, which means that either one, two or four needs to be in the nominating set. And thus the sum of x1, x2 or x4 is larger or equal to one. The mapping to the slack space itself is straightforward. We just have to rewrite the constraint equation. And as such, we just get the equation xi minus si plus the sum over the neighborhood of ixj being equal to one. Note that this also defines the span of numbers, which the slack variables must be able to occupy, which is they must be larger equal to zero and smaller equal to the neighborhood of each respective node. So how does the cubo representation of this problem look like? And again, in order to do so, we have to map the x and s variables to bitwise vectors represented by psi x and psi s. And after some rescaling and diagonalizing of the cube as much as possible, we get this tri-diangular form. In particular, we get a block representing how psi x is mapped onto psi x itself, a block for making psi x to psi s, and also a psi s psi s block. The psi x psi x block or qxx component of the cubo is relatively dense. And this comes from the fact that it's largely proportional to the adjacency matrix of the graph, which basically displays how many neighbors does each node have. The QSS component of the cubo is proportional to the transformation mapping integer slags to bitwise or qubit slags. And the component QXS is proportional to the adjacency matrix of the graph and the slag bit transformation. As such, you can roughly estimate how many entries your cubo will have. And the psi xx component is just proportional to the number of nodes in your graph. The QSS component is proportional to how many neighborhoods each node has. However, since it is in this exponential bit representation, it's actually the sum over log two of the number of neighborhood entries. As such, you would expect that your bit vector is of the size v times one plus log two v. So, how does this method perform? Let's take a look at the experiment. And the key question here is, how does this method scale? As the size of your problems go, how likely is it that you do find the true ground state of the system? To answer this question, we look at the most simple graph you can think of, which is just a line of nodes, a GV graph. And for this kind of graph, you can actually compute analytically the ground state of the system and also its degeneracy. The dominating number, meaning the number of nodes in the smallest dominating set you can find is given by the ceiling of v divided by three, where v is the number of nodes. So for example, if you have a graph of three nodes, this is one. If you have a graph of four nodes, this is four divided by three, rounded up being two, same for five and also the same for six and so on. The degeneracy of each ground state, meaning the number of different solutions which have the same energy, depends on whether or not you have a number of nodes dividable by three. So if your graph is dividable by three, like three or six, there's just one true ground state. However, if it's not dividable by three, you can have multiple ground states. For example, for G4, it's possible to find up to four different ground state solutions. You can switch each individual blue points, or you can also alternate them. So let's take a look at the probability of finding a ground state of the system. So we repeat our run several times and count how many times we end up with a solution which actually corresponds to one of the analytic solutions. And as a comparison, we also look at 
if you don't know anything about the problem and just randomly call a nodes, how do we perform against this random guessing? In the upper plot compares the random guessing against the results obtained by using a D-Wave 2000Q solver. The lower graph specifies the ratio of the D-Wave probability divided by the random guessing probability. For this particular graph, you can see that D-Wave is outperforming random guessing, ranging from a factor of 2 to a factor of almost 30. This computation, even though the graph is relatively simple, has non-trivial results which are quite interesting. For example, if you look at the random guessing graph, you can see that there are certain kinks, ups and downs, which is related to the degeneracy of the ground state. Also, the results obtained by D-Wave is following this pattern, which is an interesting result because the embedded cubo has more entries than just the number of nodes. So we truly see an effect of the degeneracy of the ground state also related to the quantum problem. We do have to emphasize, though, that for this kind of mapping, there are limitations regarding the available hardware. It is not necessarily a problem, though, of how many qubits are available, and more a problem of how close entries within the cube are to each other. So it's a precision problem. This brings us to the next point. How can we actually improve computations? And in principle, there are several directions to go. For example, one being how to resolve precision issues. What we were more particularly interested in is, is there a more general scheme to approach? So let's take a look at the time-dependent Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian of the system depends on two components. The initial Hamiltonian, being a sum of sigma x entries over all qubits, where sigma x is a poly matrix, and the final part of the Hamiltonian, which implements the problem and is a sum over sigma z entries, which interact with their neighbors and also with an external magnetic field. Here we can make a few observations. Once the amplitude of the initial Hamiltonian AS is equal to zero, and if h is constant, we do actually recover the n-dimensional Ising model and beyond one dimension, we get an anti-ferromagnetic phase transition. If H is random, we do get the spin glass model. For such system, the effect known as Anderson localization, or in terms of many spin degrees of freedom, many body localization, might affect the outcome of an annual procedure. It might be the case that if the system fails to reach thermal equilibrium, that it retains memory of its initial conditions. And this is known for the spin glass Hamiltonian, if there is large disorder, or you have large external magnetic fields, which cause individual qubits to freeze in. More explicitly, assume at the beginning of an anneal, you might have a small magnetic field such that your spin is slightly aligned to this field. If there is no many body localization, you would expect that over the entire anneal, if the magnetic field remains at the same size, that you can obtain arbitrary spins depending on the problem you are looking at. However, if there are large external magnetic fields and you do have many body localization, Independent of what the problem tells you, it might be the case that your spins just start to align with the magnetic field and do not actually follow the ground state of the problem you're interested in. If, indeed, the outcome of your experiment is limited by such localization effects, it might be desirable to formulate your Hamiltonian such that the effects of large magnetic fields or disorder are reduced. So one aspect we try to analyze is this many-body localization-inspired hypothesis. If it is possible in the time-dependent anneal, in the time-dependent Hamiltonian, to delay the appearance of strong external magnetic fields, that we may end up with a higher ground state probability. The key part of this idea is that we group and partition qubits according to external magnetic fields during the anneal. And we do so by looking at what is the average magnetic field present in the problem, and we have one group associated with a strong magnetic field, meaning that the individual qubit magnetic field is larger than this middle field, and the other group, the weak group, where the individual qubit magnetic field is smaller than the mid value. Because we do actually have the freedom of not only having one amplitude associated with initial and final Hamiltonian, it is possible to rescale the final and initial Hamiltonian qubit-wise. So we extracted the anneal schedules present and slightly shifted them according to whether or not they are in the group of the strong field and the weak field. So what you see in this plot are the amplitudes of the initial and final Hamiltonian. Going down, you have the initial Hamiltonian. Going up, you have the final Hamiltonian. And what you can see, depending on the color scheme, going from light to dark, you can see that there is a delay. The initial amplitude is getting ramped down relatively late while the final Hamiltonian amplitude is ramped up also relatively late. And as a clarification, 
when we say negative offset, we mean that we delay weak fields. When we say positive offset, we also delay fields, but now we are delaying the strong fields. So if you look at the results we obtain for such a delaying schedule, depending on whether or not you have a strong or weak magnetic field on each pupil, you can see that the results agree with the many body localization hypothesis. Namely, if we delay strong fields and reduce disorder and such, we actually do get better results while delaying weak fields and thus promoting strong fields actually decrease the probability of finding the ground state. And this brings us to the last part of the talk. How can you actually explain that varying the offsets in such a way generates a higher chance of finding ground states? To answer this question, we've coded up software simulating the anida. The simulator we have coded up solves the Schrödinger equation, or to be more precise, the von Neumann equations, and we also added decoherence terms in form of Limblad operators. One decoherence term being responsible for local decoherence, another decoherence term considering full count in statistics. The local decoherence operator captures the decay of a single qubit into its local ground state. As such, it just follows the external magnetic field and ignores interactions with its neighbors. This operator, or this decoherence model, considers two additional parameters, one being the decay rate, one being the temperature of the system, which is also shared with the other Limbert operator. The other decoherence model we consider is full counting statistics, which captures the interaction of the qubits with their thermal environment. In other words, it might potentially be the case that the given state on the hardware decays into its thermal ground state dictated by Boltzmann distribution. This obviously depends on the energy spectrum, and the parameters to consider here are again a decoherence rate and also the temperature shared with the other Limbert operator. For a given problem, we embed the cubo the same way DWIP would embed the cubo on the hardware, and once we've extracted this Hamiltonian, we solve the equations for the same annealed schedules as we have extracted from D-Wave. And this brings us to the comparison between simulation and experiment. We estimate our simulation parameters by fixing simulation results against certain offset combinations. As such, we obtain parameters for the temperature and decoherence rates, which are roughly in agreement with the D-Wave tech report. However, we want to emphasize that since we do not have control over the entire hardware, we do not expect perfect agreement. As a first comparison result, I'd like to present the probability of finding certain states namely of finding the ground state where the first node is in the dominating set, the left graph, the probability of finding the ground state where the second node is in the dominating set, the second column, and as the right column, the first excited state, which is in principle a wrong solution. For each respective column, the color coding presents which kind of offset have been used. For example, the brownish coding specifies that weak fields have been delayed, while the greenish coding dictates that strong fields have been delayed in accordance with the MBL hypothesis. The colored area represents the probability of finding the states as a result from the annela itself. The empty rectangle is the result obtained from the simulation for the same offset. Since annealing schedules for different offsets lift the degeneracy of the final Hamiltonian in a different fashion, you can observe that offsets which rather delay the strong field, colored in green, rather produce ground states where the dominating set is given by the first node. And the other way around, offsets, which rather delay the weak field, produce ground states where the second node is promoted. Adding up the probability of ending up in either of one of the ground states results in obtaining the second figure. And what you can see again is that offsets, which delay the strong field, end up with a higher probability of finding the ground state. We do find that the trend of the ground state probability offset scaling is reproduced by the simulation. Furthermore, since we find that the final state distribution for as well the ground state as the first excited state is roughly reproduced by the simulation, which is mainly coming from the full counting decoherence model, we do believe that our simulation is likely to capture the majority of the physics present in the hardware. In addition, we find that both simulation and experiment suggest the many body localization scaling hypothesis. And with this, I would like to conclude. So, as a quick summary, you have seen how to map ILPs to QMOS and how the minimum dominating set problem in case of line graph scales on the hardware. Furthermore, utilizing the many body localization hypothesis, we could improve results. And a simulation of a decoherence model could reproduce these results, suggest suggesting indeed that improvements are quantum effects. Hopefully, by the time the talk is aired, you can access the software and data utilized during this project and feel free to follow the inboxes links. Furthermore, starting this month, we've obtained additional funding through the Quantum Horizon DOP grant, and in case this sounds interesting to you or if you may know someone who's interested in that, feel free to reach out to Jason.
and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.